Today I want to address the question, has LDS doctrine changed materially since Joseph Smith? This can be more difficult than it may appear as we tend to interpret past events in terms of modern values and concepts, which can obscure changes made over time. In a world where entropy and self-interest otherwise prevail, institutions that endure are necessarily self-preserving. This bias toward self-preservation is driven by the individual desire for relevance that each of us feels on an ongoing basis. We want to matter and so we look for ways that institutions we care about can remain relevant. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this often takes the form of tracing our current beliefs and practices back to the origin of the Church and the Prophet Joseph Smith. This Ensign article from 1989 is an example of this tendency. It reads, Although the Prophet Joseph Smith's mortal ministry was relatively brief, little more than 15 years, his accomplishments and influence are eternal. Not only did he restore both the Gospel and the Church of Jesus Christ as directed by the Lord, he also introduced, through the revelations he received and through his teachings, most of the major doctrines, practices, and ordinances that characterize the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The purpose of this presentation is to examine some of those major doctrines and practices that characterize the Church today to understand how changes adopted after Joseph's death altered and in some cases contradicted what he originally restored. Few Latter-day Saint practices are as well known to non-members as the Word of Wisdom, which is a good example of a restored truth that was changed after Joseph's death. Although verse 2 explains that this principle was given not by commandment or constraint, that's exactly how it's used today, having become a test of fellowship that determines access to the Church's highest ordinances. Some members believe Joseph's interpretation of section 89 was similar to the Church's current understanding and implementation. For example, in this 1966 book, Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, the author, a professor at Utah State University who also co-authored a church Sunday school manual, asserted, quote, the prophet himself carefully observed the word of wisdom. This statement is only true if the word of wisdom is interpreted in its original context, that is, not by commandment or constraint, because if Joseph Smith were alive today based on his interpretation of the word of wisdom, not only would he not be allowed to occupy a position of leadership in the church, he wouldn't be granted a temple recommend or even be allowed to be baptized. The Word of Wisdom was received in 1833, and while some instances of leaders encouraging compliance occurred in the 1830s, these three examples taken from the history of the church in 1836 describe the Prophet Joseph's attitude with regard to drinking wine. Examples of Joseph's interpretation of the Word of Wisdom that differ from the Church's current interpretation have typically been ignored in Church publications on the subject. For example, while officiating at a double marriage, Joseph reported in the top paragraph, quote, We then partook of some refreshments, and our hearts were made glad with the fruit of the vine. This is according to the pattern set by our Savior himself, and we feel disposed to patronize all the institutions of heaven. The pattern set by the Savior himself appears to refer to Jesus' conversion of water into wine documented in the second chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus created the equivalent of an estimated 900 bottles of wine for that wedding. Later in 1836, Joseph wrote, quote, Elders Orson Hyde, Luke S. Johnson, and Warren Parrish then presented the presidency with three servers of glasses filled with wine to bless. And it fell to my lot to attend to this duty which I cheerfully discharged. It was then passed round in order, then the cake in the same order, and suffice it to say, our hearts were made glad while partaking of the bounty of earth, which was presented, until we had taken our fill, and joy filled every bosom, and the countenances of old and young seemed to bloom alike with cheerfulness and smiles of youth, and an entire unison of feeling seemed to pervade the congregation. And indeed, I doubt whether the pages of history can boast of a more splendid and innocent wedding and feast than this, for it was conducted after the order of heaven, which has a time for all things, and this being a time of rejoicing, we heartily embraced it and conducted ourselves accordingly, took leave of the company, and returned home. The final 1836 example comes from June 22nd, quote, my father and Uncle John Smith started on a mission to visit the branches of the church in the eastern states to set them in order and confer on, their brother, on the brethren their patriarchal blessings. I took my mother and Aunt Clarissa, uh, my Uncle John's wife, in a carriage and accompanied them to Painesville, where we procured a bottle of wine, broke bread, ate and drank, and parted after the ancient order with the blessings of God.
Another example of Joseph's interpretation of the Word of Wisdom was removed before publication in the history of the Church. Just a few weeks before Joseph died, his journal reports that among other activities on June 1, 1844, quote, At 1 p.m. I rode out with Dr. Richards and Oren P. Rockwell, called on Davis at the boat, paid Manhard $90, met George J. Adams and paid him $50, then went to John P. Green's and paid him and another brother $200, drank a glass of beer at Moser's. In the published history of the church, which is shown at the bottom of the slide, taken from the BYU website, the phrase about Joseph drinking a glass of beer has been removed. The revised text is otherwise identical, except for the removal of Joseph's statement that he drank a glass of beer. This is particularly interesting because of an important but misunderstood part of the word of wisdom. In verse 17, we read that the Lord recommends wheat for man, specific grains for other animals, and barley for all useful animals, and for mild drinks. What kind of mild drinks made from barley is the Lord recommending? I've been told that this meant drinks like postum and paro, but the problem is postum wasn't introduced until 1895, over 60 years after Section 89 was received, and paro didn't appear until 1954. In 1833, there was a well-known mild drink made from barley, and that drink was beer. Barley is malted, meaning it's sprouted and then dried, which is used to make beer. Mild beer was a malty, low-hopped, low-alcohol, and light-bodied beer popular during Joseph Smith's lifetime. The name mild comes from the fact that the style is low in hop bitterness and that, it, that it's thus mild compared to the other English pub staple, a style called bitter. Mild drinks made from barley are part of the recommended portion of the Word of Wisdom, not the prohibited part. The strong drinks prohibition appears to apply to distilled liquors with much higher alcohol content while beer was recommended. So it shouldn't surprise us that Joseph reported drinking a glass of beer well after receiving the word of wisdom. Apparently, the average alcohol content is about 5% for modern beer, 12% for wine, and 37% for liquor. My research indicates that the mild beer in Joseph's day generally had an alcohol content of 3-4%. to So let's track the evolution of the interpretation of the word of wisdom. It starts in 1833 when Joseph receives the revelation. It appears that from the beginning there's been a tendency to want to commandmentize this principle, potentially because compliance is externally visible. In his journal, Apostle Abraham H. Cannon cites a conversation during a meeting of the Twelve in which, quote, some desultory or casual talk was now had in which the following truths were told. Joseph Smith tried the faith of the saints many times by his peculiarities. At one time he had preached a powerful sermon on the word of wisdom, and immediately thereafter he rode through the streets of Nauvoo smoking a cigar. Some of the brethren were tried, as was Abraham of old. On October 11, 1862, Brigham wrote a letter to his son, Brigham Jr., in which he writes, It is now going on two years and a half since I have used a particle of tobacco, implying he stopped in 1860, about 25 years after he was ordained an apostle. You may be saying to yourself, wait a second, if this is true, why haven't I heard about these kinds of things? The reason is because some church authorities have actively suppressed what they view as inconvenient truths. Just like the history of the church example, where an editor removed the text about Joseph drinking beer, in the case of Brigham's use of tobacco, an apostle wanted to make sure such information was withheld from church members. President Kimball's son wrote a biography about his father's experiences as church president, and while talking about Elder Boyd K. Packer and church history, he mentioned that, quote, he and others felt uncomfortable with inclusion of information that diminished church leaders or could be twisted to discredit them. For example, Elder Stapley objected to mentioning Brigham Young's having used chewing tobacco. Elder Del Delbert L. Stapley was an apostle from 1950 to 1978. Other changes to church history include things like when Joseph Smith asked a brother Markham in Carthage jail to get, quote, a pipe and some tobacco, unquote, for the apostle Willard Richards who was having some stomach problems. And they changed it to say medicine in place of a pipe and some tobacco as well as removing that Joseph once gave some of the brethren a couple of dollars to replenish their supply of whiskey, and omitting an instance where Joseph indicated that he liked his tea strong. As Elder Packer summarized this view in his talk, the mantle is far, far greater than the intellect given to church education employees. He taught, quote, There is a temptation for the writer or the teacher of church history to want to tell everything, whether it is worthy or faith-promoting or not. Some things that are true are not very useful. The next year, in 1863, 
Brigham encouraged members to avoid tobacco because it was an imported good that drained Utah's economy of capital needed to finance local manufacturing. He suggests members grow their own or do without. Quote, this community has not yet concluded to entirely dispense with the use of tobacco, and great quantities have been imported into our territory. The silver and gold, which we have paid out for this article alone since we first came into Utah, would have built several extensive cotton and woolen factories and filled them with machinery. I know of no better climate and soil than are here for the successful culture of tobacco. Instead of buying it in a foreign market and importing it over a thousand miles, why not raise it in our own country or do without it? Four years after that, in 1867, Brigham describes word of wisdom compliance among bishops in Utah as follows. You go through the wards in the city and then through the wards in the country and ask the bishops, do you keep the word of wisdom? They will, the reply will be, yes, no, not exactly. Do you drink tea? No. Coffee? No. Do you drink whiskey? No. Well, then why, why do you not observe the word of wisdom? Well, this tobacco, I cannot give it up. And in this he sets an example to every man and to every boy over ten years of age in his ward to nibble at and chew tobacco. You go to another ward and perhaps the bishop does not chew tobacco nor drink tea nor coffee, but once in a while he takes a little spirits and keeps whiskey in his house, in which he will occasionally indulge. Go to another ward and perhaps the bishop does not drink whiskey nor chew tobacco, but he cannot give up his tea and coffee. And so it goes through the whole church. Not that every bishop indulges in one or more of these habits, but most of them do. I recollect being at a trial not long since where quite a number of bishops had been called in as witnesses, but I could not learn that there was one who did not drink whiskey, and I think that most of them drank tea and coffee. I think that we have some bishops in this city who do not chew tobacco, nor drink liquor, nor tea, nor coffee to excess. Do not throw these things away and say that they must never be used. They are good to be used with judgment, prudence, and discretion. On November 11, 1873, Brigham, quote, re-establishes School of the Prophets in Salt Lake City. At this meeting, second counselor in the First Presidency, Daniel H. Wells, says, The violation of the word of wisdom is not a matter of fellowship and will not clip a man in his glory, but he will not have the blessings which are promised. And on June 3, 1876, the Deseret News published a grand jury's audit of Salt Lake City Corporation's financial records, which show extensive transactions involving liquor. Municipal funds purchased liquor for Pioneer Day on the 24th of July and also for a party of the Mormon Battalion veterans. The city rents Brigham Young's distillery for $2,000 annually from 1861 to 1867, after which city government purchases its, its liquor directly from Howard Distillery, which is owned jointly by Brigham Young and his first counselor, Daniel H. Wells. The report observes, after completion of the railroad, the city continued to buy liquor from Brigham Young at $4 per gallon, although they could have gotten better state's liquor at $1.25 per gallon. Brigham died the next year in 1877. On the 28th of September, 1883, John Taylor reestablishes the School of the Prophets where a number of First Presidency and Apostles confess to breaking the word of wisdom and vote to obey it. However, this vote does not apply to wine, which participants drink at their meeting in October of 1883. In a meeting of the First Presidency in 12 in 1898, Wilford Woodruff, then president of the church, said he looked upon the word of wisdom as a commandment and that all members should observe it, but for the present, no definite action should be taken except that the members should be taught to refrain from meat. The minutes of the meeting record that President Woodruff said he regarded the word of wisdom in its entirety as given of the Lord for the Latter-day Saints to observe, but he did not think that bishops should withhold recommends from persons who did not adhere strictly to it. A journal entry from Apostle Abraham Cannon in that same time frame explains that, quote, he, President Lorenzo Snow, referred to the part of the word of wisdom in which the use of meat to excess is forbidden. He said we have no right to slay animals or fowls except from necessity, for they have spirits which may someday rise up and accuse us or condemn us. Beasts are the servants of the people here and will be so in eternity. Whenever we partake of animal food, we eat that which has cost an immortal life. Unless famine or extreme cold is upon us, we should refrain from the use of meat. Meeting notes from 1897, when Lorenzo Snow was president of the Quorum of the Twelve, indicate he was again concerned about members eating meat. Quote, president L. Snow introduced the subject of the word of wisdom, expressing the opinion that it was violated as much or more in the improper use of meat as in other things, and thought the time was near at hand when the Latter-day Saints should be taught to refrain from meat eating or the shedding of animal blood. And during a discussion in 1900, after he became president of the church, Lorenzo Snow again emphasized the centrality of not eating meat. 
Thomas G. Alexander was a history professor at BYU and he published this paper entitled The Word of Wisdom from Principle to Requirement in Dialogue in Autumn of 1981. I highly recommend you read this paper and there's a link included in the description of this video. He received a fellowship from the historical department of the church to write it and for his research he was able to access records some of which do not appear to be available to the public. Regarding beer he writes, in 1901 John Henry Smith and Brigham Young Jr. of the Twelve both thought that the church ought not interdict or prohibit beer, or at least not Danish beer. Other apostles, like Anton H. Lund and Matthias F. Cowley, also enjoyed Danish beer and currant wine. It appears that the Danish beer, favored by these apostles, had an alcohol content in the 2-3% range. From the Journal of Apostle Roger Clausen, we learn that in a meeting of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve on July 11, 1901, Apostle John Henry Smith, quote, had devoted considerable thought during the night to the question of selling beer at Saltaire and wondered if we were not inclined to take rather an extreme view of the case, whether, if we cut off the privilege entirely, we were not to some extent invading the rights of the Latter-day Saints. The revelation on the Word of Wisdom speaks of barley for mild drinks, DNC 8917, it is a question that demands serious thought. Have we taken an extreme view of the Word of God? Where can we strike the limit? Where can we reach the spirit of the Word of Wisdom? Apostle Heber J. Grant asked Apostle Smith if beer that is intoxicating is to be considered a mild drink. The revelation, he said, forbids the use of strong drink. Apostle Smith continued and said that the German beer was very light and mild and would not intoxicate, though he conceded that the beer of the United States is a very different character and will cause drunkenness. Apostle Smith followed up with these words, the word of wisdom, who can cut it off and patch it on for me? Each must be judged for himself. Many times water, he said, would distress him, while a little Danish beer would bring a feeling of comfort and ease. However, he believed in the word of wisdom as we teach it, as to the matter of selling liquor, said that he was simply disgusted with what he saw at Saltaire on the occasion of the old folks excursion. He came across a lot of old men, members of the church, smoking old pipes and guzzling beer. Brother Alexander continues, The death of Lorenzo Snow brought Joseph F. Smith to the presidency. Smith's views on the word of wisdom were close to those of Heber J. Grant, and it is to his administration that the path to our current interpretation of the word of wisdom leads. Dropping the emphasis on abstaining from meat, he urged the need to refrain from tea, coffee, alcohol, and tobacco. In 1902, he reversed President Snow's stand and closed the saloon at Saltaire, a move which the Protestant clergy heartily approved. Following this lead, in June 1902, the First Presidency and Twelve agreed not to fellowship anyone who operated or frequented saloons. In the same year, Joseph F. Smith urged stake presidents and others to refuse recommends to flagrant violators, but to be somewhat liberal with old men who used tobacco and old ladies who drank tea. Habitual drunkards, however, were to be denied temple recommends. The First Presidency and Twelve used wine in the sacrament in their meetings in the temple until 1906. This change occurred during Joseph F. Smith's tenure as church president. Historical context is important to understand why this long-standing practice, as well as public instances of the brethren opposing the use of alcohol, began to intensify in this time frame. As Brother Alexander explains, quote, after 1906, a strong prohibition movement developed in the United States centered in evangelical Protestant groups. Another important motive for those on all sides of the question seems also to have been the desire for acceptance. The strongest opposition to the seating of B.H. Roberts, a 70, and Reed Smoot, an apostle, in Congress, Roberts in uh, 1898 and Smoot in 1904, had come from evangelical Protestant groups, and some leaders, such as Elder Grant, were particularly sensitive to their feelings. In this time frame, due to disingenuous denials regarding ongoing polygamous marriages after the 1890 Manifesto, Mormon leaders were generally viewed, particularly by evangelical Protestant groups, as dishonest criminal perverts. The public embarrassment caused by President Smith's testimony in the Reed Smoot hearing and his subsequent issuance of the Second Manifesto in 1904, seriously condemning new polygamous unions, were the beginning of a series of efforts intended to repair Mormonism's bad public image. President Grant would use his anti-alcohol interpretation of the Word of Wisdom to seek common ground with Protestant leadership. Most vocal among general authorities in his opposition to the use of tea, coffee, alcohol, and tobacco was Heber J. Grant, who had become one of the leaders of the state prohibition movement. 
He was particularly outraged at the church members who served liquor and at some of the twelve who opposed the prohibition of liquor at Saltaire. He was also concerned with the indifference some of the general authorities demonstrated to the feelings of Protestant ministers who complained about the Saltaire saloon. Presidents Woodruff and Snow's desires to reinforce the Word of Wisdom's guidance to avoid eating meat whenever possible, as well as the Revelation's specific guidance that it was given not by commandment or constraint, were forgotten in President Smith and Grant's push to align with the National Temperance Movement, headed by Evangelical Protestants, to repair the Church's post-polygamy image. Avoidance of meat was not part of the Protestant agenda, and that influenced why that part of the Word of Wisdom was ignored as the Church's modern, relatively recent interpretation took shape. The original intent of the Revelation, that the principle be taught not by commandment or constraint, had lasted for a hundred years, longer than it's been since the, change, since the change making it a test of fellowship was formalized by President Grant during the last year of nationwide prohibition in 1933 when it was added to the handbook as a requirement for a temple recommend. It's ironic that Heber J. Grant would be the one to codify mandatory compliance to the Word of Wisdom, as he thoroughly enjoyed both coffee and beer in his youth and reported finding the strength to give them both up only when he told himself that he could drink them whenever he wanted to, but consciously chose not to. In a 2004 article entitled, Qualities That Count, Heber J. Grant as Businessman, Missionary, and Apostle, in BYU Studies Quarterly, BYU professor Ronald W. Walker explained that, quote, the word of wisdom also challenged the young man's, that is, Heber J. Grant's, faith. While his 13th Ward Sunday School tutors invade against coffee, tea, tobacco, and alcohol, the prohibition of these commodities was never made to be a religious test. Church members could be considered good Mormons and still occasionally imbibe. In fact, devout Rachel's boarding house, Rachel was Heber's mother, first introduced Heber to the taste of coffee. He soon became addicted, and despite Rachel's gentle disapproval, he found that he could not abandon it. Time after time he quit, only to find his appetite uncontrollable. Finally, Aunt Susan Green, one of his father's plural wives, served him a cup of her special blend of creamed coffee. Heber demurred, or showed reluctance. Have you promised anybody that you would quit? I have promised myself a number of times that I would quit, he allowed. This is a fine cup to quit on, said the angelic Aunt Susan, who was entirely out of character as a temptress. All right, my dear aunt. Heber raised the cup to his lips, his mouth watering. But after a moment, the full and undrunk cup returned to the table, and with that victory his craving for the beverage ceased. The young man had an even greater difficulty with beer. Fearing an early death like his father's, and convinced of the virtues of life insurance, Salt Lake City's youngest agent, Heber was at the time selling insurance, repeatedly sought coverage to protect his mother. 19th century actuarial tables, however, discriminated against slender girths, and no company would issue Heber a policy. Determined to gain weight, Heber sought out Dr. Benedict, who had an immediate solution. If Heber would drink four glasses of beer daily, which Dr. Benedict prescribed, within two years he would have the additional 20 pounds necessary for coverage. At first, Heber found beer bitter and distasteful, like his mother's herbal kinnikinnick tea, but he quickly acquired both a business and a personal taste for it. Within a year, he secured the fire insurance business of most Salt Lake City saloons and Utah breweries, an additional 10 pounds, and a growing relish for the savor of hops. His daily four-glass limit became five and occasionally grew to six. He warred with his acute sense of conscience. Rereading the Word of Wisdom, he resolved to abandon his drinking and place his health and his mother's future with the Lord, insurance or no insurance but resolutions were easier made than kept. I wanted some beer so bad that I drank it again, he confessed. Finally, he found strength in the same formula he had used with coffee. By telling himself he was free to take a drink whenever he wished, he overcame his obsession and ceased drinking. Just as quickly, he lost his trade with the saloons and breweries of the territory. The Word of Wisdom is an instructive example of how revelation received by the prophet Joseph was later altered materially. Interestingly enough, President Grant also provides a fascinating window into a much more important doctrinal change that occurred after the death of the Prophet Joseph Smith. In April of 1926, Church President Heber J. Grant, who had been ordained an apostle over 40 years before and served in the Quorum of the Twelve during the presidencies of John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow, and Joseph F. Smith, responded to a letter from a Mrs. Claude Perry in which he wrote, quote, Dear Sister, answering your letter of the 12th, 
I know of no instance where the Lord has appeared to an individual since his appearance to the prophet Joseph Smith. Sincerely your brother, signed Heber J. Grant. That same year, in a conversation with a Bishop Hooper, President Grant recorded that he, quote, told him of the temptations that came to him to resign because I had never seen the Savior and that I was unfit to be an apostle, etc. This aligns with what the original twelve apostles in this dispensation were taught when they were called in 1835. They were told that their ordination as apostles would not be complete until they had each seen the face of God. After being chosen and ordained by the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon, Oliver Cowdery, at the time assistant president of the church, explained what was expected of the twelve to make their ordinations complete. Quote, you have been ordained to this holy priesthood. You have received it from those who have the power and authority from an angel. You are to preach the gospel to every nation. Should you in the least degree come short of your duty, great will be your condemnation. For the greater the calling, the greater the transgression. I therefore warn you to cultivate great humility, for I know the pride of the human heart. Beware lest the flatterers of the world lift you up. Beware lest your affections be captivated by worldly objects. Let your ministry be first. Remember, the souls of men are committed to your charge, and if you mind your calling, you shall always prosper. You have been indebted to other men in the first instance for evidence, and for that you have acted. But it is necessary that you receive a testimony from heaven for yourselves, so that you can bear testimony to the truth of the Book of Mormon, and that you have seen the face of God. This is more than the testimony of an angel. When the proper time arrives, you shall be able to bear this testimony to the world. When you bear testimony that you have seen God, this testimony God will never suffer to fall, but will bear you out. Although many will not give heed, yet others will. You will therefore see the necessity of getting this testimony from heaven. Never cease striving until you have seen God face to face. Strengthen your faith, cast off your doubts, your sins, and all your unbelief, and nothing can prevent you from coming to God. Your ordination is not full and complete till God has laid his hand upon you. We require as much to qualify us as did those who have gone before us. God is the same. If the Savior in former days laid his hands upon his disciples, why not in latter days? This is that same quote which originally comes from the History of the Church, Volume 2, page 195, taken from the BYU website. You can see the underlying quote at the bottom that encapsulates the overall teaching. Your ordination is not full and complete till God has laid his hand upon you. Brigham claimed that he was not like Joseph in terms of being a prophet. In 1857, he said, I am not going to interpret dreams, for I don't profess to be such a prophet as were Joseph Smith and Daniel, but I am a Yankee guesser. Twenty-four years after being ordained as one of the original twelve apostles, and having served as president of the church for over a decade, Brigham Young admitted, I have flattered myself if I am as faithful as I know how to be to my God and my brethren and to all my covenants, and faithful in the discharge of my duty, when I have lived to be as old as was Moses, when the Lord appeared to him, that perhaps I then may hold communion with the Lord, as did Moses. It was believed that Moses spoke to God face to face at age 80. I am not now in that position, though I know much more than I did 20, 10, or 5 years ago. If I am faithful until I am 80 years of age, perhaps the Lord will appear to me and personally dictate me in the management of his church and people. I am not obtained this privilege at once or in a moment. True, Joseph Smith in his youth had revelations from God. He saw and understood for himself. He had heavenly visions. Angels administered to him. The vision of his mind was open to see and understand heavenly things. Three years later, Brigham again explained that his circumstances in this regard hadn't changed. I think it's likely that after a while I may be able to so humble myself and become like a little child as to be taught more fully by the heavens. Perhaps when I am 80 years of age, I may be able to talk with some being of a higher sphere than this. Moses saw the glory of God at that age and held converse with better beings than he had formerly conversed with. I hope and trust by the time I am that age, I shall also be counted worthy to enjoy the same privilege. Brigham died at the age of 77. In terms of the charge given to the original Twelve Apostles in this dispensation, President Grant, as of 1926, was not aware of any instance where the Lord had appeared to any individual since his appearance to the prophet Joseph Smith to complete an ordination. He had been an apostle since the presidency of John Taylor. Heber J. Grant was the church's last polygamous president. But by 1942, something had changed in President Grant's experience in this regard. 
In the intervening 16 years, he had become aware of apostles that claimed to have seen the Savior, but interestingly enough, he seems to consider such experiences as negative because they contributed to pride in those who had received them. As a consequence, he admits that he had never even prayed for such an experience. Quote, I have never prayed to see the Savior. I know of men, apostles, who have seen the Savior more than once. I have prayed to the Lord for the inspiration of His Spirit to guide me, and I have told Him that I have seen so many men fall because of some great manifestation to them. They felt their importance, their greatness. Toward the beginning of his presidency, President Grant admitted feeling pressure to resign because he had not seen the Lord. Toward the end of his presidency, he admitted not only that he'd never prayed for such an experience, but that he'd grown leery of the effects of such an experience. Similar experiences were reported by subsequent church leaders. In their own words, George Albert Smith, after having served as an apostle for 11 years, said, quote, I have been buoyed up and, as it were, lifted out of myself and given power not my own to teach the glorious truths proclaimed by the Redeemer of the world. I have not seen him face to face, but have enjoyed the companionship of his spirit and felt his presence in a way not to be mistaken. I know that my Redeemer lives and gladly yield my humble effort to establish his teachings. Every fiber of my being vibrates with the knowledge that he lives, and someday all men will know it. The next church president was David O. McKay. Taken from this biography of President McKay, we read, quote, On rare occasions, McKay did speak privately of his revelatory experiences as church president. In the spring of 1956, an employee in the church film department noticed that McKay was working late and having a few extra feet of film in his camera, asked if he, could, if he would consent to bear his testimony for a film record. President McKay agreed and, in the course of his brief statement, made a remarkable observation. Quote, My testimony of the risen Lord is just as real as Thomas's on the occasion, uh, speaking about John 20, 27 through 29. I know that he lives. I know that he will confer with his servants who seek him in humility and in righteousness. I know because I have heard his voice and I have received his guidance in matters pertaining to his kingdom here on earth. End quote. It seems reasonable to infer from that statement that President McKay had received a face-to-face -face visit from the Savior. But President McKay made a similar statement five years later during an interview with John Cook, a reporter for the Sacramento Union. Ted L. Cannon, the church's press representative, was president of the interview and wrote an account. Quote, Mr. Cook then said he was hesitant about asking his next question, and that he hoped President McKay would understand the spirit in which he was asking, not for a part of his story, but strictly from a personal inquiry standpoint, that he hoped the president would, be, would not answer if he did not feel it was a proper question. He then asked President McKay if he had ever seen the Savior. President McKay answered that he had not, but that he had heard his voice many times, that he had felt his presence and his influence. Then he told how some evidences were stronger than that of sight, and recalled the occasion when the Savior appeared to his disciples and told Thomas, who had doubted, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And he said he liked to believe that Thomas did not actually look up, but knelt to the Savior's feet and gave his answer, My Lord and my God. President McKay then smiled and said, That is quite a testimony I have given you. I don't know when I have given this before. End quote. Sometimes the language used by general authorities is ambiguous enough to allow someone to infer that they have seen the Savior face to face when they actually haven't. After President McKay came Joseph Fielding Smith. On page 49 of the Teachings of the Presidents of the Church, Joseph Fielding Smith Manual, we read, I did not live in the days of our Savior. He has not come to me in person. I have not beheld him. His Father and he have not felt it necessary to grant me such a blessing as this. But it is not necessary. I have felt his presence. I know that the Holy Spirit has enlightened my mind and revealed him unto me so that I do love my Redeemer. I hope and feel it is true, better than everything else in this life. I would not have it otherwise. When Elder Smith wrote this, he had been an apostle for 38 years. President Harold B. Lee said the following at a BYU devotional in 1973, I bear you that sacred testimony that I know with a witness that is more powerful than sight. Sometime, if the Spirit prompts me, I may feel free to tell you more, but may I say to you that I know as though I had seen that He lives, that He is real, that God the Father and His Son are living realities, personalities with bodies, parts, and passions, glorified beings. 
Elder Oaks expressed sentiments similar to President Grant's letter in 1926 in this excerpt from a multi-stake youth fireside in Bellevue, Washington in January of 2016 when he answered a question from the audience. Just because an apostle or church president hadn't received a face-to-face -face visit from the Savior by the time they made the statements we've reviewed in this presentation, doesn't mean they didn't eventually receive one afterwards and choose not to share it with their fellow apostles or the world. But it does become easier to see why the doctrine that an apostle's ordination is not complete until the Savior appears to him personally was de-emphasized over time. Some of the evidence we've seen in this presentation indicates that transition may have occurred during the presidency of Heber J. Grant, based on his own personal statements, but it's clear that visitations seem not to have occurred as they did during Joseph Smith's life, beginning with Brigham Young. As president of the church, Brigham Young had been ordained an apostle 27 years before, and it still hadn't happened for him. President Heber J. Grant had been ordained an apostle 60 years before, and it still hadn't happened for him. Joseph Filling Smith had been an apostle for 38 years, and it still hadn't happened for him. And Elder Oaks had been an apostle for over 30 years, and it still hadn't happened for him or any of the apostles he knew in the First Presidency or Quorum of the Twelve. The contrast between the apostles' original charge and current expectations is significant. From the original charge that, quote, your ordination is not full and complete till God has laid his hand upon you, end quote, to President Grant's admission that, I have never prayed to see the Savior, the Joseph Fielding Smith's claim that I have not beheld him, but it is not necessary, to President Lee's testimony that I know with a witness that is more powerful than sight, I know as though I had seen that he lives, that he is real, to Elder Oaks' assertion in 2015 that apostles are called to be witnesses of the name of Christ, this is not to witness of a personal manifestation. It's clear the expectation has changed since 1835. Originally, it was understood that having conversed face-to-face -face with the Savior was superior to other forms of confirmation. After President Grant's presidency, the opposite belief is expressed, that a witness of the Holy Ghost is somehow superior to the parting of the veil and conversing directly with the Lord. In the twelfth chapter of the book of Numbers, Moses' siblings were criticizing him as a prophet. So the Lord called all three of them, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, to the tabernacle where he appeared in the pillar of the cloud. 
the Lord explained to them from his point of view what it means to be a prophet. Quote, and he said, this is the Lord speaking, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house, which I take to mean that Moses isn't like other prophets that just receive visions and dreams, but because he's the most faithful in all God's house or family, he receives more. Verse 8, with him, meaning Moses, will I speak mouth to mouth, or as we would say in English, face to face, even apparently, and not in dark speeches or statements that are hard to understand. And the similitude or likeness of the Lord shall he behold. In other words, Moses will see me. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God identifies a prophet when he appears to him in a vision or dream, or more significantly, appears to him face to face, which is the most profound form of revelation reserved for God's most faithful servants. It's important to understand that in the gospel that Joseph restored, the apostles weren't the only ones exhorted to seek the face of God. All members were. Although this doctrine is found throughout the scriptures and the teachings of the prophet Joseph, it's been almost forgotten to the point that many members treat it as nice but not necessary, or even avoid it as irrelevant or inappropriate. Joseph taught that each one of us as members is supposed to seek the face of God because our salvation depends on it. Joseph taught that the ultimate objective for disciples of Christ is to obtain a promise directly from the mouth of God that they'll be saved in the celestial kingdom. This doctrine is known by several names, having one's calling and election made sure, receiving the second comforter, receiving the testimony of Jesus, obtaining the more sure word of prophecy, and being sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. It was concerning this promise of salvation that Joseph exhorted the saints in 1843, brethren, Never cease struggling until you get this evidence. In 1839, the prophet Joseph taught, Peter exhorts us to make our calling and election sure. This is the sealing power spoken of by Paul in other places. He then read several verses from the book of Ephesians, including verse 13, which reads, You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Joseph continues, This principle ought in its proper place to be taught, for God hath not revealed anything to Joseph but what he will make known unto the twelve. And even the least saint may know all things as fast as he is able to bear them. For the day must come when no man need say to his neighbor, Know ye the Lord. For all shall know him who remain, from the least to the greatest. Here he's referencing prophecies in the books of Jeremiah and Hebrews, talking about the millennial day in which all those who survive the cleansing fire of the second coming would know the Lord face to face. How is this to be done? It is to be done by the sealing power and the other comforters spoken of, which will be manifest by revelation. Joseph goes on to explain what he means by the other comforter. There are two comforters spoken of. One is the Holy Ghost, the same as given on the day of Pentecost, and that all saints receive after faith, repentance, and baptism. This first comforter or Holy Ghost has no other effect than pure intelligence. The other comforter spoken of is a subject of great interest and perhaps understood by few of this generation. After a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, and is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God, and the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. This is the promise of exaltation from God that I mentioned earlier. Joseph continues, when the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter, hence the name the second comforter, which the Lord hath promised the saints, as is recorded in the testimony of St. John in the 14th chapter from the 12th to the 27th verses. He then reads several of those verses, including, and this is Jesus talking, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And if a man love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now what is this other comforter? It is no more nor less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. 
and this is the sum and substance of the whole matter, that when any man obtains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him or appear unto him from time to time, and even he will manifest the Father unto him, and they will take up their abode with him, and the visions of the heavens will be opened unto him, and the Lord will teach him face to face, and he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And this is the state and place the ancient saints arrived at when they had such glorious visions. Isaiah, Ezekiel, John upon the Isle of Patmos, St. Paul in the three heavens, and all the saints who held communion with the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Jesus himself is the second comforter. Can you imagine something that would bring greater comfort than to know that Jesus had already promised you exaltation? Those that have had this experience become part of something called the Church of the Firstborn, which appears to be an organization on the other side of the veil. It's not just about receiving a face-to-face -face visit from Christ so that you can say you saw Him. It's about receiving a promise from Him, hence the name the Holy Spirit of Promise, which He delivers face-to-face, -face, which Peter calls having your calling and election made sure. The source for this is the book, The Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, which used to be a staple for all missionaries. Joseph taught this principle throughout his ministry. DNC 88 was received at the end of 1832 and the beginning of 1833, and teaches the same thing. Wherefore, I now send upon you another comforter, even upon you, my friends, that it may abide in your hearts, even the Holy Spirit of promise, which other comforter is the same that I promised unto my disciples, as is recorded in the testimony of John. This comforter is the promise which I give unto you of eternal life, even the glory of the celestial kingdom, which glory is that of the church of the firstborn, even of God, the holiest of all, through Jesus Christ his Son. Joseph used the word knowledge to mean multiple things as he continued to teach about this doctrine. Because Christ delivers this most sought-after promise face to face, in the process, recipients by definition come to know him or have knowledge of him, rather than faith alone. The other aspect is that once a promise is secured from the Savior, one obtains knowledge, rather than mere hope or belief, that their life or their walk is pleasing to God. The temple endowment is a symbolic representation of the pursuit of this promise. A year after revealing the temple ordinance in the red brick store, and nearly a year before his death, Joseph delivered several sermons on obtaining knowledge of a promise from God. It was in this context that Joseph taught, a man is saved no faster than he gets knowledge. On May 14, 1843, in Yale, Rome, Illinois, Joseph taught the following as captured in Wilford Woodruff's journal. Joseph then read the second epistle of Peter, first chapter, 16th to last verses, and dwelt upon the 19th verse. For reference, the 19th verse reads, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. With some remarks, add to your faith, knowledge, etc. The principle of knowledge is the principle of salvation. This principle can be comprehended by the faithful and diligent, and everyone that does not obtain knowledge sufficient to be saved will be damned. The principle of revelation is given us through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now there is some grand secret here and keys to unlock the subject. Notwithstanding, the apostle exhorts them to add to their faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, etc. Yet he exhorts them to make their calling and election sure. And though they heard, and though they had heard an audible voice from heaven bearing testimony that Jesus was the Son of God, this is a reference to the previous verses where Peter alludes to what he, James, and John experienced on the Mount of Transfiguration when they heard God's voice declare. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Yet he says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Now wherein could they have a more sure word of prophecy than to hear the voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son. Now for the secret and grand key. Though they may hear the voice of God and know that Jesus was the Son of God, this would be no evidence that their election and calling was made sure, that they had part with Christ and were joint heirs with Him. They then would want that more sure word of prophecy, that they were sealed in the heavens 
and had the promise of eternal life in the kingdom of God. Then, having this promise sealed upon them, it was an anchor to the soul, sure and steadfast. Though the thunders might roll and lightnings flash, and earthquakes bellow, and war gather thick around, yet this hope and knowledge would support the soul in every hour of trial, trouble, and tribulation. Then knowledge through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the grand key that unlocks the glories and mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Then I would exhort you to go on and continue to call upon God until you make your calling and election sure for yourselves by obtaining this more sure word of prophecy and wait patiently for the promise until you obtain it, etc. Three days later in Ramus, Illinois, Joseph taught the following. He said the more sure word of prophecy meant a man's knowing that he is sealed up unto eternal life. He also showed it is impossible for a man to be saved in ignorance. Paul had seen the third heaven, and I more. This is similar to DNC 131, 5 through 6, which reads, The more sure word of prophecy means a man's knowing that he is sealed up unto eternal life. By revelation and the spirit of prophecy, through the power of the holy priesthood, it is impossible for a man to be saved in ignorance. And four days later, on May 21st, 1843, from the temple stand, Joseph taught a sermon in which he said, It is one thing to receive knowledge by the voice of God, this is my beloved Son, etc., and another to know that you yourself will be saved, to have a positive promise of your own salvation in making your calling and election sure. That is the voice of Jesus saying, My beloved, thou shalt have eternal life. Brethren, Never cease struggling until you get this evidence. James Burgess, who was also present at the same talk, recorded this important nuance in his notes. First chapter, second epistle of Peter, the first four verses are the preface to the whole subject. They are the three grand keys to unlock the whole subject. First, what is the knowledge of God? Second, what is it to make our calling and election sure? Third and last is how to make our calling and election sure. Answer, it is to obtain a promise from God for myself that I shall have eternal life. That is the more sure word of prophecy. Peter was writing to those of like precious faith, with them the apostles, first to be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is the testimony of Jesus. This brings important insight to DNC 76. To receive the testimony of Jesus is equivalent to having one's calling and election made sure. It is his testimony or promise that one has earned a place in the celestial world. That makes DNC 76-74 more comprehensible. These are they who are of the terrestrial, who receive not the testimony of Jesus in the flesh, but afterwards received it. In chapter 13 of the Teachings of the Presidents of the Church, Joseph Smith Manual, we read, Reflect for a moment, brethren, and inquire whether you would consider yourselves worthy of a seat at the marriage feast with Paul and others like him, if you had been unfaithful? Had you not fought the good fight and kept the faith, could you expect to receive? Have you a promise of receiving a crown of righteousness from the hand of the Lord with the church of the firstborn? Here then we understand that Paul rested his hope in Christ because he had kept the faith and loved his appearing, and from his hand he had a promise of receiving a crown of righteousness. The ancients, though persecuted and afflicted by men, obtained from God promises of such weight and glory that our hearts are often filled with gratitude that we are even permitted to look upon them while we contemplate that there is no respect of persons in his sight and that in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is acceptable with him. And though we cannot claim these promises which were made to the ancients for they are not our property merely because they were made to the ancient saints yet if we are the children of the Most High and are called with the same calling with which they were called, and embrace the same covenant that they embraced, and are faithful to the testimony of our Lord as they were, we can approach the Father in the name of Christ as they approached Him, and for ourselves obtain the same promises. These promises, when obtained, if ever by us, will not be because Peter, James, and the other apostles walked in the fear of God and had power and faith to prevail and obtain them, but it will be because we ourselves have faith and approach God in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, even as they did. And when these promises are obtained, they will be promises directly to us, or they will do us no good. 
In DNC 88, the Savior describes the second comforter as the promise which he gives of eternal life, which is the Holy Spirit of promise. The scripture reads, this is on the left, Wherefore, I now send unto you another comforter, even upon you, my friends, that it may abide in your hearts even the Holy Spirit of promise, which other comforter is the same that I promised unto my disciples, as is recorded in the testimony of John. This comforter is the promise which I give unto you of eternal life, even the glory of the celestial kingdom. The church's definition on the right downgrades the Holy Spirit of promise to the Holy Ghost or first comforter. This lowers the bar significantly, replacing a promise received directly from the Lord with a personal manifestation of the Holy Ghost, witnessing that the saving ordinances have been performed properly. The church's current definition on the right reads, the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit of promise. He confirms as acceptable to God the righteous acts, ordinances, and covenants of men. The Holy Spirit of promise witnesses to the Father that the saving ordinances have been performed properly. Expectations fade, doctrines fade, and then are completely changed and hardly anyone seems to notice. The church's downgraded definition can be found in the Guide to the Scriptures online. It's common for members of the church to believe that if they receive the church's ordinances, stay active, don't commit any serious sins, and feel the Spirit in their life from time to time, that they can expect to enter the celestial kingdom after death and judgment. It's like successfully scaling Utah's tallest mountain, King's Peak, only to realize that the real test was climbing Mount Everest. The commonly held gospel of cultural Mormonism places the bar of expectation so much lower than the fullness of the gospel restored by Joseph that it's like Jesus is the fullness at the top of Everest, and we're congratulating ourselves for having scaled the highest point in Utah, which is several thousand feet lower than even the Everest base camp. Why have we abandoned the pinnacle of what Joseph taught? The fullness of the gospel was abandoned by some not long after Joseph's death. It's interesting that the disappearance of this most important doctrine was accompanied by the insertion of another one in its place, unquestioned obedience to the church president as a replacement for seeking the face of God. Heber C. Kimball, first counselor to Brigham Young in the First Presidency, taught, Let us rise up as a people and turn unto the Lord our God with full purpose of heart, and peradventure our sins may be remitted and forgiven and blotted out. This is what the Lord has placed men to lead you for. You cannot see God. You cannot behold Him and hold converse with Him as one man does with another. But He has given us a man that we can talk to and thereby know His will just as well as if God Himself were present. Unquestioned obedience to church leadership is a theme that emerges continuously throughout the period known as the Reformation that occurred in 1856 and 1857. In the same talk, obedience to Brigham is put forward as the key to member spiritual success several times. For example, I have told you a great many times that the word of our leader and prophet is the word of God to this people, and you play with those words, and you neglect them. Am I afraid to risk my salvation in the hands of a man that is appointed to lead me and to lead this people? No, no more than I am to trust myself in the hands of the Almighty. He will lead me right. If I do as he says in every particular, in every circumstance, in poverty, in riches, in sickness, and in death, that is the course for me to take. And if that is the course for me to take, it is the course for Brother Grant to take, and for the Twelve Apostles, for the Seventies, for the High Priests, for the Elders, and for every person in the Church and Kingdom of God. We should be like clay in the hands of the potter. Bless your souls, that is just, a true, just as true a figure as can be presented before a people. If they ever saw a potter work, but if they never saw one work, they do not know what course he takes, any more than a person knows about a mill that never saw one. Well, this is the course for us to take, to be like clay in the hands of the potter. Who is the potter? God our Father is the great potter, the head potter. And Brother Brigham is one of his servants to preside over this pottery here in the flesh. And his word is the word of God to this people and to those that he has called to assist him in this great work. Joseph taught the opposite. In an 1842 talk to the Relief Society, Joseph read the 14th chapter of Ezekiel, in which the Lord condemns elders of Israel who go to the prophet to ask him what God says, rather than going directly to God themselves. God calls this setting up idols in our hearts, and such idolatry, even of a true prophet, will result in such elders being cut off from the midst of God's people. 
verses 7 and 8 from the 14th chapter of Ezekiel are at the bottom of this slide, which read, For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself, and I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. After reading all of Ezekiel 14 to the sisters, Joseph taught, starting at the top of the slide, President Joseph Smith read the 14th chapter of Ezekiel, said the Lord had declared by the prophet that the people should each one stand for himself and depend on no man or men in that state of corruption of the Jewish church, that righteous persons could only deliver their own souls, applied it to the present state of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, said if the people departed from the Lord, they must fall, that they were depending on the prophet, hence were darkened in their minds, in consequence of neglecting the duties devolving upon themselves, envious towards the innocent, while they afflict the virtuous with their shafts of envy. The next month, President Heber C. Kimball addressed members and referenced criticism of Brigham due to the handcart companies that were straggling into the Salt Lake Valley. The Willie Company had arrived in Salt Lake on November 9th, and the Martin Company would arrive on November 30th, while this talk appeared in the Deseret News on November 12th. Quote, there is a spirit of murmuring among the people, and the fault is laid upon Brother Brigham. For this reason the heavens are closed against you, for he holds the keys of life and salvation upon the earth. And you may strive as much as you please, but not one of you will ever go through the straight gate into the kingdom of God, except those that go through by that man and his brethren, for they will be the persons whose inspection you must pass. This compares to Joseph's teaching in the Book of Mormon that is, is the Savior and not the church president that will be the keeper of the gate. O oh, then, my beloved brethren, come unto the Lord, the Holy One. Remember that his paths are righteous. Behold, the way for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course before him, and the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. And there is none other way, save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. It's pretty clear. Either Jesus is the keeper of the gate and he employeth no servant there, or according to President Heber C. Kimball, not one of you will ever go through the straight gate into the kingdom of God except those that go through by that man and his brethren. This is once again the opposite of what Joseph taught. In Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible, which he referred to as the fullness of the scriptures, we better understand Jesus' teachings in this regard. Jesus clearly taught that responsibility for our actions can't be outsourced to church leaders when he taught in verse 44, Therefore, let every man stand or fall by himself, and not for another, or not trusting another. Jesus also specifically warns his followers about being led astray by church leaders in verse 46, And if thine eye which seeth for thee, him that is appointed to watch over thee, to show thee light, become a transgressor, and offend thee, pluck him out. In 1831, Joseph taught the saints that except the church receive the fullness of the scriptures, that they would yet fail. And what was Brigham teaching that according to Heber C. Kimball, the saints must obey in every particular? This is what Brigham taught that same day. There are sins that men commit for which they cannot receive forgiveness in this world or in that which is to come. And if they had their eyes open to see their true condition, they would be perfectly willing to have their blood spilt upon the ground that the smoke thereof might ascend to heaven as an offering for their sins, and the smoking incense would atone for their sins. Whereas, if such is not the case, they will stick to them and remain upon them in the spirit world. I know when you hear my brethren telling about cutting people off from the earth, that you consider it strong doctrine, but it is to save them, not to destroy them. This is what has become known as the doctrine of blood atonement. In the same talk, Brigham explained further, I do know that there are sins committed of such a nature that if the people did understand the doctrine of salvation, they would tremble because of their situation. And furthermore, I know that there are transgressors who, if they knew themselves and the only condition upon which they can obtain forgiveness, would beg of their brethren to shed their blood. I will say further, I have had men come to me 
and offer their lives to atone for their sins. It is true that the blood of the Son of God was shed for sins through the fall and those committed by men. Yet men can commit sins which it can never remit. It was observed by Brother Grant that we have not seen God, that we cannot converse with Him. And it is true that men in their sins do not know much about God. Brigham was not the only one to teach this doctrine. On the same day, Jedediah M. Grant, second counselor in the First Presidency, taught the following. I say that there are men and women that I would advise to go to the president immediately and ask him to appoint a committee to attend to their case, and then let a place be selected and let that committee shed their blood. We have those amongst us that are full of all manner of abominations, those who need to have their blood shed, for water will not do. Their sins are of too deep a dye. Brethren and sisters, we want you to repent and forsake your sins. And you who have committed sins that cannot be forgiven through baptism, let your blood be shed, and let the smoke ascend, that the incense thereof may come up before God as an atonement for your sins, and that the sinners in Zion may be afraid. These are my feelings, and may God fulfill them. President Grant was the father of Heber J. Grant. Five months later in the tabernacle, Brigham taught that blood atonement was a way of showing love for the wayward. And I will say that the time will come and is now nigh at hand when those who profess our faith, if they are guilty of what some of this people are guilty of, will find the axe laid at the root of the tree and they will be hewn down. All mankind love themselves and let these principles be known by an individual and he would be glad to have his blood shed. That would be loving themselves even unto an eternal exaltation. Will you love your brothers and sisters likewise when they have committed a sin that cannot be atoned for without the shedding of their blood? Will you love that man or woman well enough to shed their blood? While some characterize Brigham's teachings of blood atonement as rhetorical, we now know that he backed up his words with actions. In that same time frame, Brigham, suspecting two non-Mormon ex-convicts headed to California after their release from prison, might steal church-owned horses, he sent letters to church leaders suggesting that they be killed discreetly. In Brigham's words, If any such thing we have suggested should occur, we shall regret to hear a favorable report. We do not expect there would be any prosecutions for false imprisonment or talebearers left for witnesses. Brother Johnson, who was the Bishop of Springville, you know about these things. Have a few men that can be trusted on hand and make no noise about it and keep this letter safe. We write for your eye alone and to men that can be trusted. The second letter was similar but added another directive. Be on the lookout now and have a few trusty men ready in case of need to pursue, retake, and punish. In the case of mistaken identity, four other travelers to California were ambushed on the same night of February 17th as they camped along the Santa Clara River in southern Utah. The men, the men scrambled out of the firelight except for one who'd been shot in the face. In spite of finding more than 50 bullet holes in their bedding the next morning, they all survived. It appears that the attackers believed they were pursuing, retaking, and punishing the former prisoners according to Young's wishes, but the intended targets of the assault passed through the area untouched two days later. President Young's letter had a further, more deadly effect and showed that the Reformation had not dissipated. Aaron Johnson, Bishop of Springville, to whom the first letter had been addressed, called a series of council meetings. At the first one, held shortly after he received the letter, he spoke of people going away, that they might steal horses, and that he had instructions that they needed to be watched. Before a second meeting, Brigham Young's discourse in the tabernacle in Salt Lake City on February 8th was published in the Deseret News. This is the same talk quoted earlier that includes the reference to shedding blood of someone whom you love to secure for them forgiveness of their sins. The instruction to the local bishop was applied to justify the elimination of an apostate. Within days of this issue of the Deseret News reaching Springville, Bishop Aaron Johnson called a second council meeting. In this one, instead of singling out the released prisoners, he called attention to William R. Parrish, a longtime church member, Parrish had become disillusioned and was planning to go to California. At the second meeting, the bishop called two men, Gardner G. Duff Potter and Abraham Durfee, to find out when the parishes were planning to leave. According to one participant, Bishop Johnson said, some of us would yet see the red stuff run. 
and the remark was made by someone that dead men tell no tales. Bishop Johnson's counselor, John M. Stewart, another witness to the meeting, said that Potter asked for the privilege of killing Parrish whenever he could find the damned curse. The bishop had replied, shed no blood in Springville. Stewart understood that blood would probably be shed, not in Springville, but out of it. Following the bishop's orders, Potter and Durfee found Parrish and told him that they too wished to leave Utah. They soon gained his confidence. A third council meeting was called by the bishop, after which events moved quickly. On March 15, 1857, outside the city gates, William Parrish was killed by knife wounds after a hard struggle, and one of his sons was shot dead. Duff Potter was also killed, having been mistaken for the young Parrish son. The Parrish Potter murders were not investigated by the church, and Bishop Johnson continued as the local bishop, enjoying favor with President Young. The following Pioneer Day, President Young invited Bishop Johnson to join him in his important celebration in Big Cottonwood Canyon. In a separate case, the Aiken party of six California men were also killed. First arrested and accused of being army spies, they were taken to Salt Lake City and imprisoned. Four were taken south, and on November 25th, when crossing the Severe River south of Nephi, they were shot by Mormons and the Mormon reinforcements sent by the bishop from Nephi to escort them. Two died immediately. Two survived. The survivors were tended to, then sent back north. On the return trip, they were shot to death on November 28th. A fifth member of the Aiken party was killed near Bountiful. The sixth and final member disappeared. The parish murders, Aiken party murders, and others were not investigated by either the church or state while Brigham Young was territorial governor. Nothing was done until a judge appointed from Washington, D.C. came to Utah to investigate the matter later. William Hickman, a member of the church at the time, admitted to killing one of the Aiken party at the request of Brigham Young one of several people that Hickman claimed he killed at Brigham's request. The greatest violence to occur during the era of preaching blood atonement happened at Mountain Meadows. This involved the killing of about 120 unarmed men, women, and children by a confederacy of Mormons and Indians. The killings were orchestrated by two local stake presidents that were also militia leaders. Assistant church historian uh, Richard Turley explained, quote, on September 11, 1857, some 50 to 60 local militiamen in southern Utah, aided by some American Indians, massacred about 120 immigrants who were traveling by wagon to California. The horrific, the horrific crime, which spared only 17 children aged 6 and under, occurred in a highland valley called the Mountain Meadows. To put the enormity of the evil involved in context, the Mountain Meadows massacre was the largest organized mass murder of white civilians in American history until the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. The only Mormon to be executed for his role in the massacre was John D. Lee, who said, I believe that most of those who were connected with the massacre and took part in the lamentable transaction that has blackened the character of all who were aiders or abettors in the same were acting under the impression that they were performing a religious duty. I know all were acting under the orders and by the command of their church leaders, and I firmly believe that the most of those who took part in the proceedings considered it a religious duty to unquestioningly obey the orders which they had received. He also explained that, I believe then as I do now, that it was the will of every true Mormon in Utah at the time that the enemies of the church should be killed as fast as possible, and that as this lot of people had men amongst them that were supposed to have helped kill the prophets in the Carthage jail, the killing of all them would be keeping our oaths of and avenging the blood of the prophets. The oath he mentions is an oath of vengeance that Brigham added to the endowment ceremony in which participants vowed to avenge the deaths of Joseph and Hiram. Apostle Abraham Cannon documented the content and nature of the oath as follows. Quote, in speaking of the recent examination before Judge Anderson, Father, Apostle Cannon is referring to his own father, George Q. Cannon, first counselor in the first presidency, said that he understood when he had his endowments in Nauvoo, Illinois, that he took an oath against the murderers of the prophet Joseph as well as other prophets, and if he had ever met any of those who had taken a hand in the massacre, he would undoubtedly have attempted to avenge the blood of the martyrs. Brother Joseph F. Smith, who would a few years later become the sixth president of the church, was traveling some years ago near Carthage, Illinois, 
when he met a man who said he had just arrived five minutes too late to see the Smiths killed. Instantly a dark cloud seemed to overshadow Brother Smith, and he asked how this man looked upon the deed. Uh, Brother S. was oppressed by a most horrible feeling as he waited for a reply. After a brief pause, the man answered, just as I have always looked upon it, that it was, that it was a deed cold-blooded murder. The clouds immediately lifted from Brother Smith, and he found that he had his open pocket knife grasped in his hand, in his pocket, and he believes that had this man given his approval to the murder of the prophets, he would have immediately struck him to the heart. This entry is uh, from Apostle Cannon's diary on Friday, December 6, 1889. John D. Lee continues, It was reported that in the train, meaning in the wagon train that was attacked at Mountain Meadows, was a man who had openly boasted of having been present at the assassination of Smith, and that he has openly threatened to take the life of the present prophet. This story is generally believed to be utterly without foundation, circulated by the Mormon leaders to stir up the wrath of the people against the emigrants, and to exonerate themselves if their share in the slaughter of these people should ever become known. In 2007, Elder Henry B. Eyring said, speaking from the site of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, what was done here long ago by members of our church represents a terrible and inexcusable departure from Christian teaching and conduct. We cannot change what happened, but we can remember and honor those who were killed here. We express profound regret for the massacre carried out in this valley 150 years ago today and for the undue and untold suffering experienced by the victims then and by their relatives to the present time. A separate expression of regret is owed to the Paiute people who have unjustly borne for too long the principal blame for what occurred during the massacre. Although the extent of their involvement is disputed, it is believed that they would not have participated without the direct direction and stimulus provided by local church leaders and members. President Brigham Young's feelings about the massacre were very different from Elder Eyring's. During a May 1861 meeting with President Young, over three years after the massacre, John D. Lee recorded a private conversation in which Brigham quote, revealed his feelings about the massacre. He said, the company that was used up at the Mountain Meadows were the fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, and relatives of those who had murdered the prophets and merited their fate. The killing of the women and children was the only thing that ever troubled him, but under the circumstances it could not be avoided. Young feared those who wanted to betray the brethren, but he told Lee, those who revealed the secret would be damned and go down to hell, and for now such traitors had run away. He then told Lee what had happened six days earlier as he pondered the fate of the Arkansans at the monument that contained their bones. On a cold morning in 1861, the prophet, the Mormon prophet and his entourage of some 60 men, women, and children stopped at Mountain Meadows. They viewed uh, Carlton's monument, a memorial to the dead erected previously at the site of the wagon battle, put up at the burial place of 120 persons killed by Indians in 1857. The monument was beginning to tumble down, but the wooden cross and its inscription, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, still stood above the rock cairn. Brigham Young read the verse aloud, altering the text to fit his mood. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I have repaid. According to Wilfred Woodruff's journal, what Brigham said was subtly different. Elder Woodruff claimed Brigham said, quote, said it should be vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I have taken a little, end quote. Either way, it's clear that Brigham viewed the murders as the righteous execution of God's vengeance by members of the church. Anyway, continuing, Dudley Levitt recalled how Young directed the destruction of the monument so that all present could all present could deny that he had ordered it. Quote, he didn't say another word. He didn't give an order. He just lifted his right arm to the square, and in five minutes there wasn't one stone left upon another. He didn't have to tell us what he wanted done. We understood. The murders described in this presentation all happened in 1857, and are cited as examples of what was going on in the church at the time Brigham repeatedly taught the doctrine of blood atonement. It did not take long after the death of Joseph for important changes to begin to make their way into the church. These deviations from the gospel in both belief and action from what Joseph restored are critical because they allow us to understand specific behaviors prophesied in the Book of Mormon years before they happened. Have you ever wondered where in the Book of Mormon the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is mentioned? 
Does the most correct book on the face of the earth even mention us? It does, but we have to recognize that it refers to us as Gentiles. On the title page of the Book of Mormon, we're taught that the book would, quote, come forth in due time by way of the Gentile. And in the Kirtland Temple dedicatory prayer in DNC 109 on the right hand side, the Prophet Joseph refers to the members of the church as, quote, us who are identified with the Gentiles. In that context, it was the Savior himself that prophesied what would happen to the church that Joseph would restore. And thus commanded the Father that I should say unto you, At that day when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, and shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts above all nations, and above all the people of the whole earth, and shall be filled with all manner of lyings, and of deceits, and of mischiefs, and all manner of hypocrisy, and murders, and priestcrafts, and whoredoms, and of secret abominations. And if they shall do all those things, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. There is no other group of Gentiles since the days of Joseph who had the fullness of the gospel to be able to reject it besides the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Due to the apostasy, other Christian religions had only a portion of the gospel. This verse can only be talking about us. The rejection of the fullness of the gospel would be accompanied by murders, priestcrafts, which are men setting themselves up as a light to the world, rather than encouraging focus on the only true light, which is the Savior, and whoredoms, which if you've seen my other video, you'll know that there's compelling evidence to suggest that it was Brigham and not Joseph that introduced polygamy into the church. The phrasing that the Lord uses at the end of this prophecy is interesting. Why would Jesus say that when the Gentiles shall reject the fullness of his gospel and commit murders and priestcrafts and whoredoms, that, quote, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them? We would expect him to say that he would take the fullness of the gospel from among them, because that's how we say it. We take something away from somebody. So why would he say he will bring the fullness of the gospel from among us? Because he is the fullness. The fullness is not something he can drop off and then come back and pick up when we ignore it and don't take care of it. He brings the fullness from among us because wherever he is, that's where the fullness is. And when we, as an institution, for whatever reason, reject the fullness and de-emphasize it to the point that none of us can remember the last time the second comforter or the Holy Spirit of promise or seeking to have your calling and election made sure or obtaining a promise from the mouth of the Lord was mentioned in general conference or a Sunday school lesson, we have to admit that all is not well in Zion and that each of us has an important decision to make. Even if the church to which I belong has rejected the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, am I going to, as an individual, abandon it in my own personal religious beliefs and aspirations? The choice is personal. This prophecy was published before the church was even organized. That's the hallmark of a true prophet. To be perfectly clear, I am aware of some individual members who have received face-to-face -face visits from the Lord and received special assurances or promises from the Savior. And some of those faithful individuals happen to be leaders in the church. But I was careful to include the words of church presidents themselves and not those of their critics to better understand how often Jesus has appeared to those chosen to preside over the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I believe that many church leaders have been good people who tried their hardest to do what was right and encourage members to draw close to the Savior. But we can't reject the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ without consequence. And the consequence has been that the church has been effectively left to the guidance of the first comforter, or Holy Ghost, rather than by the second comforter, which is the Savior himself. And it's important enough that Jesus, in the Book of Mormon, the scripture at the heart of our religion, prophesied that this would happen. As Jesus said, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. In 1997, a religion writer for the San Francisco Chronicle interviewed President Hinckley and asked him, You are the prophet, seer, and revelator to the Mormon Church? To which President Hinckley responded, I am so sustained, yes which reminded me of a similar interchange that President Joseph F. Smith had during the Reed Smoot hearings in 1904 when he was asked, Are you prophet, seer, and revelator? To which he responded, 
I am so sustained and upheld by my people. Both presidents were also asked about revelation. President Hinckley's interviewer asked, and this belief in contemporary revelation and prophecy, as the prophet, tell us how that works. How do you receive divine revelation? What does it feel like? Answer, let me say first that we have a great body of revelation, the vast majority of which came from the prophet Joseph Smith. We don't need much revelation. We need to pay more attention to the revelation we've already received. Now, if a problem should arrive on which we don't have an answer, we pray about it, we fast about it, and it comes, quietly, usually no voice of any kind, but just a perception in the mind. I liken it to Elijah's experience when he sought the Lord. There was a great wind, and the Lord was not in the wind, and there was an earthquake, and the Lord was not in the earthquake, and a fire, and the Lord was not in the fire, but in a still small voice. Now that's the way it works. And this from the Reed Smoot hearing. Senator Hoar, is the doctrine of the inspiration of the head of the church and revelations given to him one of the fundamental or non-fundamental doctrines of Mormonism? Mr. Smith, Joseph F. Smith, the principle of revelation is a fundamental principle to the church. Senator Hoar, I speak of the revelations given to the head of the church. Is that a fundamental doctrine of Mormonism? Mr. Smith, yes, sir. Senator Hoar, does or does not a person who does not believe that a revelation given through the head of the church comes from God reject a fundamental principle of Mormonism? Mr. Smith, he does, always if the revelation is a divine revelation from God. Senator Hoare, it always is, is it not? It comes through the, the head of the church? Mr. Smith, when it is divine, it always is, when it is divine, most decidedly. The chairman, I do not quite understand that, when it is divine. You have revelations, have you not? Mr. Smith, I have never pretended to, nor do I profess to have received revelations. I never said I had a revelation except so far as God has shown to me that so-called Mormonism is God's divine truth. That is all. There is a tendency to believe that we, as modern disciples of Christ, must be more advanced in our religious understanding and worship than the people we read about in the Book of Mormon. I think it's more appropriate to evaluate how spiritually developed any particular group of people is by the presence of the gifts of the Spirit and interaction with heavenly beings, because that's the standard established in the Book of Mormon. I believe it was to clarify this issue that Moroni included the following in his testimony. Has the day of miracles ceased, or have angels ceased to appear unto the children of men, or has he withheld the power of the Holy Ghost from them, or will he? so long as time shall last, or the earth shall stand, or there shall be one man upon the face thereof to be saved. Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for it is by faith that miracles are wrought, and it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, woe be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, and all is vain. Implying that without angels, all, including our religion, has become vain. For no man can be saved, according to the words of Christ, save they shall have faith in his name. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, then has faith ceased also, and awful is the state of man, for they are as though there had been no redemption made. Moroni left no doubt about the source of his testimony, as well as other prophets in the Book of Mormon. And there were many whose faith was so exceedingly strong, even before Christ came, who could not be kept from within the veil, but truly saw with their eyes the things which they had beheld with an eye of faith, and they were glad. And behold, we have seen in this record that one of these was the brother of Jared. And then shall ye know that I have seen Jesus, and that he hath talked with me face to face, and that he told me in plain humility, even as a man telleth another in mine own language, concerning these things. And now I would commend you to seek this Jesus of whom the prophets and apostles have written, that the grace of God the Father, and also the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, which beareth record of them, may be and abide in you forever. Amen. Nephi's view is similar. Quote, and now I, Nephi, write more of the words of Isaiah, for my soul delighteth in his words. For I will liken his words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children. For he verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him, and my brother Jacob also has seen him, as I have seen him. Wherefore, I will send their words forth unto my children to prove unto them that my words are true. Wherefore, by the words of three, God hath said, I will establish my word. Nevertheless, God sendeth more witnesses, and he proveth all his words. As Moroni asks, For do we not read that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? 
and in him there is no variableness, neither shadow of changing. Only the truth can make us free. As missionaries, we encourage people to pray about the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon and then to interpret a confirmation as evidence of the truthfulness of the Church. When we understand what the book itself actually says about us, we'll be more careful about such unsupported leaps of logic. That we might know the truth and thus be made free is my prayer.